lineup of speakers for you um, this this evening or this afternoon, depending on which time zone you're in. Um, we're going to uh, we're going to start off by um, Oh, I should say actually a couple of housekeeping notes before I introduce the speakers. Um, this um, session will be recorded, this webinar is going to be recorded and after the webinar there's going to be an email sent out with a link to be able to download it. If you have any questions, there is a, there's a question box in the, in the interface in the little download um, application that you, uh, that you all downloaded to access the webinar. If you have any questions, please type them into that box and we'll get to them at the at the end of the session and we'll be able to kind of have that kind of discussion then. Okay, so to introduce the speakers, um, we've got a, a great panel for you uh, for you today. We're going to start off with Graham Woodward from, um, from Wiley. Now, Graham has been a marketer at Wiley for, for 14 years, um, so very experienced in the field of marketing. Um, he's uh, spent the majority of those years working closely with engineering, statistics, materials and physics communities in the global research division. So he's a he's a man after my own heart. He's a similar background to my own. Since 2013, he's um, he's been working with the author marketing team um, and providing new services and products across the global research community. With this remit, there's been an opportunity to experiment, develop, and roll out a number of initiatives, including Altmetrics, to aim uh, in an aim to add value to the overall author experience. So you can uh, so you can just get from that bio a little bit of a taste of what what Graham's going to be talking about um, today. So um, Sue is uh, Sue Silver is the, is going to be our second speaker, and she is the editor in chief of Frontier, Frontiers in Ecology and Environment. Um, Sue uh, she obtained her PhD in comparative neurophysiology and animal behaviour from the University of London in in 1981. So she's a uh, so she's a biologist uh, by training and she switched from uh, research into scientific publishing in the mid-80s and worked on a variety of journals for different publishers before moving to Washington DC uh, to launch and edit a new journal for the Ecology Society of America and that's Frontiers in Ecology and Environment. So a very different um, type of publisher um, from from Graham um, instead of a, a large commercial publisher Sue is uh, Sue works for a uh, for a small to medium um, society publisher, and we're going to explore. She's going to explore some of the some of the ways in which um, some of the ways in which uh, the uh, OSA has been able to um, use Altmetrics uh, to further its own business. Now, lastly, um, we're going to hear from Rebecca Weltzelbach, uh, Weltzenbach, beg your pardon for the mispronunciation. She's the journals coordinator at Michigan Publishing. So uh, again, this is a this is a very a different voice to the previous two speakers. Um, Rebecca is a librarian by training, and um, and as such, she works for the uh, she works for the Michigan um, she works for Michigan Publishing, and she works closely with faculty at Michigan and elsewhere, helping them to uh, to launch and sustain independent OA journals in the humanities and social sciences. So it's um, so it's it's very much the sort of the sorts of activities that a lot of librarian publishers um, engage in. So we're going to hear a little bit about how Altmetrics applies applies to her and applies to the work that she's done. And after that we'll have we'll have some time for some questions. All right, so I'll before we pass before I pass you on to Graham, I'm going to give you a little bit of background about Altmetrics generally and about altmetric.com, uh, your hosts for this evening. Um, so Altmetrics, like all great movements, and Altmetrics is sometimes referred to as a movement, it started with a manifesto. Actually, I've always thought that the word manifesto is a little bit of a grand uh, claim for uh, for what was effectively a blog post by uh, by this handsome devil here, Jason Prem, who's the co-founder of Impact Story, at the time he was at uh, the University of uh, Chapel Hill, North Carolina. So, in the uh, in the original Altmetrics manifesto, Jason and his co-authors um, talked about a couple of issues, particularly one of which was the fact that it's difficult for researchers to keep up with all the research, all the research and all the all the papers and articles that are being uh, brought out in their field and as such there is a need for improved filters a better way of understanding what is impactful what is important and what is interesting to read and what they should be reading so one of the issues um, that uh, another of the issues, the second issue that uh, that he talked about in that manifesto was uh, the fact that traditional citation metrics, uh, particularly um, particularly citations, traditional citations are slow. They are lagging in how quickly they can uh, they can they can demonstrate impact. So if we look on that, so this is an example of it. This is a uh, 
this is a an article that was published in in Nature, I believe. And you can see on the left the total citations, the kind of traditional citation metric. You can see that those that those um, metrics are empty; that nothing is recorded after after a year or so. But then you look at all metrics. You look at tracking things online. You look at um, you look at all the different ways in which uh, articles can be communicated, and you can see that there is a there is a decent amount of attention being paid to this article, and this makes sense, right? Because if I were to write a, a scientific article and publish it, and then uh, somebody else at a different institution were to read it, get an idea, run an experiment, write that article and publish it, it's going to take several years for that process to take place. But if, on the other hand, that other person was writing a blog post or writing a news article or a tweet or any other kind of or any other kind of attention paid to that article, that might happen a lot quicker. So the so the idea is is that uh, altmetrics can provide you with a filter and a way of engaging and, and understanding impact much more quickly. But there's a third aspect that I think is increasingly important for publishers, and that's the and that's what we call the evaluation gap, and that is the difference between what are the traditional measures of impact, which is citations and peer review and that sort of thing, and the actual real world impacts and uses of research that. Uh, that, that happen in society. And that includes things like public engagement, education, policy impact, medical advances, and economic and social progress. Um, essentially, science is more important than simply citations, or science can engage with society in more ways than just citations. There are all sorts of effects that it can have, everything from new medical treatments to, uh, to social and economic advances. So how can we possibly capture all of this? So, uh, if we look at the big picture, there are two kinds of engagement. Inside of academia, you have the traditional journal articles and the, and the academic books and the term papers and so forth, uh, meetings and conferences, presentations. Um, and outside of society, there are press coverage, there's social media and blogs, there's policy and legislation, patents and economic impacts. So, there's both the, the academic um, the, the, the academic impact and there's also the societal impact and the ways in which uh, research, uh, science, social sciences and humanities affects the broader way and affects the broader society and it's important to be able to, to monitor all of that activity. So the question is how can we measure both academic and societal research impact? Well the saving grace of all this is that the conversation has gone online there are 44,000 online mentions of scholarly articles every day. Um, that's one mention every two seconds. So that's 50,000 unique articles are shared every week. Now according to the study that we've done at Altmetrics, that means there are more than 3.5 million articles with tracked attention data. That's an awful lot of data that can be used to assess the, uh, assess the impact of scientific articles. It's also important to note that that there is that funders and governments care about this information. As we move into a situation where, particularly as as funding is getting increasingly difficult to obtain for academics, uh, governments and funders wish to maximise the types of impact that they're getting from the from the research that they're funding. Um, particularly in the UK, there's something called the Research Excellence Framework, which accounts for which accounts for uh, 10 to 15 percent of all academic funding or higher education funding and that is particularly targeted, the REF is particularly targeted uh, towards, the, uh, towards the economic um, impact of, of, uh, of research and the, uh, and, and the societal benefit. The NSF in the US, um, they also, there's an impact statement here, that they, there's a statement that they, that they put out about impact um, here which you can see at this, at this website. Um, and and they've been they've been quoted as saying that they wish to that that every time that uh, a researcher writes a a, uh, a grant proposal they have to show how they are demonstrating the broader dissemination and impact of that research um, to the wider community. So funders are interested in this. Governments are interested in this um, globally. Not just the the REF and the NSF. Not just the UK and the NSF. The NIH are also interested in this kind of data. Um, the Dutch um, have uh, their own. Um, excellence Research Assessment, the ERA, and then in Australia there's a similar, uh, beg your pardon, in, in Holland it's the SEP, and then Australia has the ERA. There's a number of different uh, projects worldwide to look at, at this sort of impact. So in summary, what is Altmetrics? It's an alternative, more immediate measure of attention. What it's not 
is a replacement um, for uh, for traditional bibliometrics. It's a it's a it's a complement to it. Um, but it comes from non-traditional sources, policy documents, blogs, mainstream news, and social media, and it provides a larger contact context for for the impact, providing a multifaceted picture of engagement. So now just to talk a little bit about Altmetric itself, um, it's important to draw a distinction between Altmetrics, the field, and Altmetric, the company. Altmetric is a data science company that tracks attention for research outputs. And basically what we do is we gather this data and we find a way to, uh, and we find ways to disseminate that to all of the appropriate stakeholders. In other words, we help give credit where credit is due. We follow an enormous number of sources, and we have probably the largest, and we have the largest database of on metric information. Um, we cover th over 1,300 uh, news outlets. Um, we uh, we cover social media and blogs, um, policy documents, patents, um, post-publication peer review, and reference manager mentions. It's important to note that this is not just as broad a net as possible, but we have an extensive list of sources that are hand curated, making sure that each source is relevant and valuable for judging scholarly impact across the emerging media. And we surface that data in interesting ways. Many of you will be familiar with the Altmetric Donut, which assigns a score in terms of alternative impact. And you can, uh, you can see that there um, several times in this slide. Um, that score, it's, uh, it's important to note, is not just uh, the number of mentions uh, across the internet for a particular article. Um, the different sorts of mentions, the different sorts of, of um, the different sorts of things like, uh, for example, uh, social media mentions versus policy documents are weighted differently. So, uh, so for example, a, um, a guideline in a, uh, in a health advisory um, board is, is weighted more heavily than a tweet, for example. Um, but we go beyond simply showing that score. Um, for researchers and, and publishers alike, we're able to give them access to the, to the deep data, to drill down into things like demographics, um, to look for emerging markets, to look for emerging themes and ideas, and allow people to slice and dice the data in all sorts of, sorts of different ways. You might imagine, for example, comparing the, the optometric impact of, of your uh, content versus a competitor's, for example, or one field versus another. So and here's the bit where I tell you the stuff that you already know. Um, the publishing landscape has changed, um, or it is changing. Increasingly, we're in an author-centric publishing environment. That's most acutely obvious uh, with, the, with the rising influence of open access business models, but it's also true for, for traditional, um, for traditional um, subscription access publishing as well. It's important for publishers to show how they are adding value um, to the uh, to the research workflow, um, to the uh, to the publication information workflow, and demonstrating that the content that they publish has a positive influence on society. So, how can Altmetrics help us achieve this? It has a number of different ways, and we'll hear more about this from the different speakers as we move through the seminar, through the webinar. Um, it helps publishers understand their audience. It helps them understand how research is being received and interpreted and monitor the conversations around it. It allows them to report back to authors, editorial boards, society partners, um, whoever, whoever might be interested in understanding the impact of the, of the research, of the, of the content. It allows you to measure the success of outreach and promotional activity. If you, and this is an interesting application um, for me, because if you have, let's say, uh, a new product where you are gathering together uh, content from a particular from a particular area, or you are um, trying to promote, uh, you know, a particular sort of content um, without the use of, of altmetrics, there's no real way of monitoring the effectiveness. Of that of that effort, our metric gives you that valuable feedback, gives you that valuable metric to allow you to to do those kinds of uh, experiments in an informed way, and um, it allows you to do things like identifying hot topics and emerging areas, uh, and that demographics information can be very interesting um, to help you demonstrate uh, innovation and acknowledgement um, of the wider conversation. So, without uh, further ado, I am going to to pass you on to our first speaker. So, Graham from um, from Wiley, he's going to talk to you a little bit about the experience that they've had and the lessons that they've learned um, exploring altmetrics in a little bit more depth than I did here, and uh, with a view to providing more meaningful data, particularly to authors. Now, just bear with me one second as I pass over the presentation to.
Hi, Graham. I think you might be. Uh, you might. There you go. You can all see my screen now. Is that correct? Yes, that's what. Excellent. So, thank you, Phil. Um, that acts as a really nice introduction to kind of explain the mindset for for where Wiley were several years ago, as, as to why why would we choose to engage with article level metrics and explore that area much more. And really, we were seeing just a massive increase in general engagement and discussion around article level metrics. And we wanted to be able to better serve our what we perceived as author and researcher needs and what authors and researchers were telling us where it was clearly a need. And so we stepped in and uh, started a trial with all metrics. And uh, we, we, we began on a very small scale. Uh, we tried just six journals. We set those up with uh, an altmetric trial. And we really wanted to understand what value was there in the various metrics that could be shown, and what value was there for authors and researchers. If they were presented with this information, what would they actually do? We, at this point, obviously knew what discussions were going on in the research community and where people were starting to indicate general interest and general enthusiasm. But when faced with it at a practical level, what would actually happen? As I say, we set that up across just six, six journals. And uh, we, we really didn't do anything particularly special or innovative beyond the, the basic um, integration that Altmetric provides. So here on the screen, you see Angavanta Chemi, one of our flagship chemistry journals. We have the article metric score set up. Um, on that on the screen for each individual paper and this is how we proceeded with our with our trial anger van Kemi was one of the six journals we we chose we didn't go for any further substantial launch activity we didn't put out large numbers of um, PR statements or anything like that we didn't advertise widely across the site that we had this available because we had it on just such a limited number of journals and what we really wanted to do was just, in the first instance, to see if the conversations around article level metrics would then continue across the journals themselves, whether our community of researchers would start to engage. So we left the ball very much in, in researchers' court. The information was provided, but how they chose to engage and respond to it was entirely up to them. And uh, our first responses after just a few weeks were, were really very impressive. They, they reinforced the reasons why we, we really thought we should be looking at this a lot more. So this little snapshot just shows you after the first few weeks, just across six journals, what was starting to happen. And this, uh, this really reinforced, okay, yes, there's, there's definitely interest here. So the 10,000 click-throughs, those are people clicking on individual article altmetric scores and then moving through to the altmetric page to show the individual um, scores on a particular article. So people were very genuinely looking and seeing, OK, what's of interest here? What's, what's this score? What, what's happening? And uh, from that, we then introduced a very small survey. We had site capture technology that allowed us to see anyone who'd started to click through and actually look at the article level metrics. And we were then able to track um, key responses and from them um, as, to, as to what they were actually doing. As we very much felt when faced with a page like this, it's great, but what does that 112 in a donut actually mean? And what does it actually mean to an author or to a researcher? And how would they go about using this? So what I'm going to share with you for the rest of my talk are some of those insights that we drew from our survey and that really informed how we progressed with our altmetric trial. And then a couple of, share with you a couple of insights of what happened next. So the first thing I should point out is this is a very, very small survey sample. It was just um, site capture for people who'd immediately clicked through onto the um, website, looked at the article level metrics, and who then responded. To a, to a very short survey just asking them their opinion. And this represents just a few weeks' worth of data, 46 people who responded there and then. And we weren't looking for hundreds of thousands of people to tell us their opinion. 
we were really looking for a very quick snapshot to validate what we were doing or to say that really, no, there, there was really very little interest. And what you'll see as we, as we drill in, we had some very, very simplistic questions for people. Are those article level metrics useful? Oh, well, clearly 91% thought that they were at least somewhat too very useful, which uh, is a great start. Okay, so they're useful. Could we ask people to tell us which of those metrics were actually useful? And a simple suspicion here was that people would simply tell us whatever was the, the top of the list in terms of the metrics that are presented. Just pick the one that's at the top. Okay, so let's, let's say you look at the list of all metrics. Tweets always appear at the top. So would people just tell us that tweets were the most useful thing to them simply because they never looked further down that list? Well, no. The data showed us that people really, really did look quite deeply into the list and explored lots of different activities. And some of these represent multiple click-throughs to actually see this data and this information. So we could see that people were engaging, which reinforced our earlier finding that people were staying on the pages for longer, looking at this information and clearly doing something. So then we ask quite a pertinent question. Are the article level metrics actually enhancing your experience or your value of the journal article? And 77% saw there was a definite enhancement to the journal by including this information. So here we've moved from just simply saying, theoretically, this kind of reporting, these kind of metrics are interesting, to actually someone being able to validate and know this is, there's real value here. There's, there's something that I get from this as a reader. So next, we posed a really very interesting question. So would you be more likely to submit a paper to a journal that's showing you this kind of information? And I should also point out this data, a small sample set, yes, but also now this is data that, um, that's about 18 months old when we, when we were originally looking at this. And even at that point in time, half of the people polled said, yes, I, I, this would influence how I select a journal to, to submit articles to. So we then, we then continued delving a little bit deeper and really looked at what, the, what are people actually using these metrics for. And there was one, there was definitely one here that was a real surprise. It, we, weren't, we weren't really expecting to see this. We, we, we suspected a number of different issues, but that second bullet point, to discover a network with, with researchers who are interested in a similar area of their work. Now that, that was, that wasn't something we were expecting to see from the metrics because a lot of the discussion really centers around use of these metrics to support um, impact, impact statements for funders and to understand who's reading your paper and you know, that, those kind of aspects. But to actually say, well, there's an ability to network here because you can start to see, firstly, the impact of your paper, but you can see who's read it, so therefore you can see what their interests are and you can start tracking that round. And that, that started to open up some very interesting discussions within Wiley about what that might really mean and to where we go from there. So we then, we then dropped in a quick, a quick sense check. Uh, we knew our trial was very basic. We had only just gone with the, the simple uh, way of showing article level metrics on our website on Wiley Online Library. And so we wanted a quick sense check. Does this make sense? Uh, have we shown you this in the right way? Or would there be a better way to do this? And overall, people were telling us, no, this is very positive in, in terms of how they were using and looking at the metrics, but also how we were displaying them was, was very well received. This, is, this was a good way to show the data. So with that information, that was overall, those, those responses were enough validation to say, yes, our trial across six journals is definitely working, so we will continue looking at that and allowing that to, to run and start to build up usage over time and, and see how that, how that progresses. And from then, we then extended our trial across all of our open access portfolio. All of our open access journals were then opened up to Altmetric. And if you look at our website right now, we've clearly gone much further than that. We now have Altmetric across every single one of our journals. And the kind of findings that I've shared with you here, we see that continually, that, that we, we see that being reinforced over time. So with that, I will say 
thank you for listening, and I hope you found that useful. And I will now pass you on to Sue Silver. Well, thanks very much, Graham. While we're waiting for uh, for uh, Sue to Sue to get ready, um, Sue's. Um, just as a quick reminder, Sue's uh, Editor-in-Chief of Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment, and she's going to talk a little bit about why a medium to small size soci soci pardon, scientific society um, decided to add alt metrics to its journal web pages. Now, I'm sure that Sue will be le much less tongue-tied than I am, so I'll just hand it over to her. Okay. Thank you, Phil. Um, so, hello, everybody. Um, as Phil said, uh, I'm Sue Silver, and I work for the Ecological Society of America, and in particular, edit a journal, Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. Um, I need to just start the presentation by uh, explaining a little bit more about the Ecological Society and its journals uh, to put in context uh, why we decided to um, add uh, altmetrics uh, donuts to our web pages. So, um, Uh-oh. Okay. Uh, having trouble moving my presentation along. Ah, here we go. Okay. So, um, you could call the Ecological Society of America uh, a medium or medium small size uh, society. We have about nine to 10,000 members. Um, and this year we are 100 years old, which we're all celebrating like crazy. Uh, but otherwise, we're pretty much like most other societies. Uh, we hold an annual meeting, um, we publish journals, and we try to support our members in, in any way that they need through publications, scientific meetings, certification, and so on. Um, one of our goals is to promote the science of ecology and we want to do that through education, through our education department. Uh, we try to uh, get uh, information about ecology and environmental science to policy makers. Uh, we work uh, with some people up on Capitol Hill and also local uh, and state uh, government. Um, and we try to get a certain amount of information out to uh, the public um, via mainstream media and, and also social media. Um, but we have a number of different uh, communities that uh, we're trying to support. Um, obviously, um, we, we're, with our members, uh, with our publications, we're, we're trying to sort of um, get people talking to each other who are in the same field, uh, who are in associated fields uh, of ecology and environmental science. And then, of course, there are all those people who use uh, ecological data, the consultants and, uh, and many others. Um, our members come from a very wide range of specialties and subspecialties. Um, and so, as I said, we're trying to get uh, this kind of information through uh, to all kinds of people, the decision makers, resource managers, that could be landowners, farmers, people in charge of forests and rivers and, and all kinds of others. And also, of course, teachers in classrooms, in colleges and so on. And in fact, anyone needing information on ecological and environmental science. Um, in addition to our journals, in terms of communication, uh, we, uh, we, we tweet, uh, we have uh, the ESA blog, and we do press releases uh, uh, at fairly regular intervals. So here are our journals, uh, our six peer-reviewed journals. The top four are our print journals. Uh, the bottom left two are open access online only. Uh, more recent journals that we've launched. Uh, bottom right is a, a bulletin that goes uh, that's open access to everybody, but specifically uh, carries a lot of information about ESA. Uh, and then top right uh, is my own particular baby, um, the Frontiers in Ecology and the Environment. So Frontiers launched in February 2013. Uh, sorry, 2003, and so this year. Uh, we're in our 13th volume. 
Um, it's sent to all the members of ESA, and that's everybody from emeritus professors all the way down to students, and it pops into their mailbox at 10 times a year. And I've put there that it's a hybrid journal in the sense that uh, we not only carry peer-reviewed scientific papers in the form of research communications and reviews and so on, but we also have a lot of fun stuff. Uh, we have an international news section, uh, we do opinion pieces and letters, we run special series, we did one on ethics, we're currently doing one on natural history, um, and we even had one where uh, it was written entirely by students and for students, and we even have our own back page columnists. So we're, we're sort of a little bit different from your classical uh, research journal. But what characterizes all of our content is that it has to appeal to our very broad readership, people from all those different specialties. Um, and so everything in there has to be as accessible and reader friendly as possible, uh, not too specialized and not too narrowly focused. So that you know any member or anybody, because we also have uh, a large number of libraries who take the journal, and we need to make sure that there's something in there for everybody who picks up a copy. In short, um, it seemed like Frontiers would be a great fit uh, to add the altmetrics system. Um, I first heard about it as a, as a, as a, at a user group uh, for our um, peer review submission system. Uh, back in November of 2013 and I must admit I was um, so excited about it that I went back and persuaded my executive director of ESA uh, to let Frontiers try it. Um, because the journal, uh, because of the way that the journal is, very often it's the case that um, we are the guinea pig for things that the rest of the ESA journals will follow on or not follow on at a later date. Uh, we have no issue in January, so it was in February 2014, so just a very few months later, uh, the, the altmetrics donuts were being displayed uh, on our pages. Um, and since altmetrics looks at social media, among other things, we thought it made sense to get more involved in social media, so although ESA has its own Twitter account, we decided to launch the Frontiers Twitter account at the same time, so in February of 2014, for that issue, we started tweeting about our content in that issue, um, so not just the scientific papers, but all of the content, um, and in actual fact, I should say that uh, the second and third highest scoring, altmetric scoring items we've ever had were actually to letters uh, rather than to um, big scientific papers. So, there are lots and lots of ways of measuring impact, as I'm sure all of you know. Among the first and oldest is the impact factor, uh, counting citations, but I'm sure many of you have noticed that uh, a lot of people like to say that the impact factor is uh, going a little bit out of fashion, especially among early career scientists. Um, we have a high impact factor, um, but as I say, a lot of people like to say that it's it's not really um, you know as up to date anymore, and that there are many more new and exciting ways uh, to collect metrics uh, in information. Um, Google Analytics will tell you how many hits you've had and you know what they've looked at and for how long and so on. But um, an altmetrics uh, it adds to that by uh, telling you who is talking about papers and absolutely telling you what they're saying. Um, on top of that, nowadays, um, as I'm sure we all know, scientists are using social media for professional purposes to share and discuss ideas and to tell each other about interesting and relevant papers uh, and we definitely want to be able to follow those conversations and that's what Altmetrics is allowing us to do. Finally, at 100 years old, ESA uh, needs to show that it can keep up with the times um, and certainly it's been most popular among our younger members. Uh, we haven't done any surveys, but it's been the early career scientists uh, among our membership who've been telling us 
uh, that they like it and congratulated us for adding this. And last but not least, let's face it, it's bright, it's attractive, and it's cool. And I certainly felt it was exactly the right thing to do for Frontiers. So there are benefits for everyone, we believe. And in, in primarily, it's a one-stop shop for all of the information uh, about who's talking and what they're saying uh, about different content. Um, mainstream media, social media, and all kinds of other places, um, as was described before. Authors want to know who's talking about their papers and what they're saying. Um, readers want to know what's hot uh, in the journal and in their field generally, and you know can get some guidance by looking uh, at the scores. And it's also pretty good for editors to know which papers in the journal are getting the most buzz, what's working and what's not working. Uh, and along those lines, I should say it's very useful to see when our community doesn't like something and you get a wave of furious tweets and Facebook comments. It's nice to be plugged into that so that you can respond if, uh, if that's appropriate and you know, uh, try and put out some information and try and put out the fire. Um, so, in short, Altmetrics plugs us into whatever cons conversations are going on. So, uh, with that, I will stop and hand you on to the next speaker and just hope that everybody will have some good questions at the end of the three presentations. Thank you. Yeah, I'd just like to say at this point, everybody, please do write any questions in the question box. Um, We'll have a few minutes at the end of the at the end of everybody's talk to uh, to answer any questions. So hopefully we'll get a good conversation going. And I'll hand you over now to uh, to Rebecca, who's going to uh, talk a little bit about her experience at Michigan Publishing. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, everyone can hear me. I'm unmuted. Good. I'll I'll go ahead then. Um, so I'm the journals coordinator at Michigan Publishing. A little bit of context about our organization. Uh, Michigan Publishing is the hub of scholarly publishing at the University of Michigan and is a part of our university library. We publish scholarly and educational materials in a range of formats for wide dissemination and permanent preservation. We provide publishing services to the University of Michigan community and beyond and we advocate for the broadest possible access to scholarship everywhere. Michigan Publishing consists of three major channels. The University of Michigan Press, Michigan Publishing Services, and Deep Blue, which is our institutional repository. And I'll say a bit more about all three of these as, as we go on. As journals coordinator here, my role is to bring new journal projects on board. Uh, but just as important, I also tend to our current journals by working closely with our production department and with our editors, who are faculty here at Michigan and also elsewhere. I was one of several people here at Michigan Publishing that was really involved in getting Altmetric up and going on our publication. So I'm sort of speaking on behalf of a small group here today. So in contrast with the other panelists we've just heard from, we've just launched Altmetric last month on our publication. Um, so it's very new to us, but here's sort of how we got here. We've been thinking about this for a couple of years. Some of our journal editors have asked us about providing some sort of Altmetric tools, and we've been interested in doing it ourselves. As part of the library, we've sort of been waiting out and watching as the library brought in a couple of different vendors and did some trials. We are hoping that maybe an opportunity to piggyback on some sort of institutional web metrics contract would, would um, emerge. But nothing really came out of that. So we sort of waited and watched on the library for a while and finally decided that as a publisher, we needed to go ahead and take action on this for ourselves. This coincided with our new director, Charles Watkinson, arriving last summer. And the stars all sort of aligned for us to, to finally get started with this. Um, so it took us a few months to get everything in place. We started our conversations with Altmetric in October 2014, last year. And we didn't launch the badges on our journals and, and OA books until April 2015 this year. Um, so again, at this point, we've actually spent more time on the sort of back end negotiations and technical details than we have on watching this in action and, and seeing how it works. Nevertheless, we have a bunch of, it, well, a few exciting stories already emerging and, and lots to learn yet. So Michigan Publishing produces a wide variety of, of different sorts of publications. Um, how are we using Altmetric? Where does it apply? The University of Michigan Press publishes rigorously peer-reviewed scholarly monographs in a variety of humanities and social science disciplines. Michigan Publishing Services um, covers a number of journal and monograph projects and publishing services that are aimed primarily, although not exclusively, 
at serving the needs of the campus here at Michigan. The focus in this imprint is on providing swift digital first publishing, with usually with an open, actually always with an open access component. Um, and it's open to a wider range of approaches to review. It's not always um, strictly peer reviewed in the same way that, that the monographs are. Finally, Deep Blue is our institutional repository. It currently contains over 117,000 items, and about a third of these have never been published anywhere besides this platform. Of course, many others are preprints or sort of author versions of articles published in other journals. Um, but again, one third have been distributed for the first time through Deep Blue. So far, um, Altmetric is most fully implemented in our Michigan Publishing Services area. That is, all the materials that fall under that umbrella are being tracked by Altmetric, and all of them have the donut displayed, the donut aura or the little badge. Um, however, we're gradually implementing it also in Deep Blue and on um, some of our open access imprints in the press where it's appropriate. So I'm going to talk a little bit about those, but I'll be focusing mostly on Michigan Publishing Services. So I'm going to hone in now on our journals program. This is part of the publishing services line that I talked about. The aim of our journals program is to provide an affordable, efficient, integrated, foreign digital publishing solution for important journals in niche areas which may have no other home. Through adherence to external standards, we will help them to demonstrate editorial excellence and meaningful impact. We're closing in on 40 of these journals that we host, and um, they're mainly in the humanities and social sciences and mainly run by uh, Individuals are very small groups of basically dedicated volunteers, faculty doing this on the sidelines along with their research and teaching. So that's the sort of nature of the publication that we're looking at here. How will Altmetrics specifically benefit our journals? Um, here's sort of three different use cases that we've thought of, although this certainly isn't a comprehensive list. Um, it's especially helpful for journals in sort of really particular niche subject areas that may have an audience across the globe but, but not be obvious or, or well known. Um, it's important also for journals that either won't qualify for or just wouldn't benefit from traditional measures of impact or success like the journal impact factor. A lot of our journals um, would frankly never be granted or assigned an impact factor and even if they did it, it wouldn't be a very impressive one um, simply because of the discipline that they're in and, and what their goals are. Altmetrics provides us with a different way of, of looking at their success and impact. And finally, journals in disciplines who are looking at a general public audience provide some new texture to what we already know about the audience and the impact of this journal. And finally, across the board, we're hoping that using all metrics will allow our journals, our journal editors, to communicate back to their colleagues, to their deans, to their home institutions, the value of what they're doing and the impact that it has. So first, here's an example from one of our journals, the TransAsia Photography Review. This is an open access journal run by a single editor who is based at Hampshire College. This journal launched in 2010 is so far um, actually showing our most interesting altmetric scores of any, any of our publications. Um, this particular screenshot shows the impact of one article. It's an English translation of an article originally published in Bengali in the late 1980s. It's about the role of women photographers in early 20th century Bengal. And of particular interest to us here is that one third of the conversation around this article um, is happening mostly on social media, mostly Twitter, among users based in India. Um, so Graham just told us that the Twitter demographics is actually the least interesting metric for users perhaps, but we were really excited to see this um, international reach for this article. Another example comes from uh, the Journal of our International Institute. The International Institute is an institute here at the University of Michigan, and this has been their journal. Um, it's been published really irregularly for many years, and actually within the last couple of years, they've told us they've decided to cease doing it altogether. Um, the journal was run by staff at the International Institute, so no clear faculty editor sort of at the helm to, to um, add to its reputation. And these staff would recruit faculty editors here to write on their work and sort of make it accessible to a general reading audience. Um, so you can see for all these different reasons, this is a journal, not least because it's not publishing now, but this is a journal that would not be um, really picked up by or, or fit well into the impact vector um, world. And yet, some of its older articles continue to have traction um, in many different ways. So this gives us a way to capture that and communicate about it. The case I'm showing here is an article published in 2005 um, about genocide perpetrated against the people of Namibia in 1904 through 1907. Um, Altmetric shows us, interestingly, that this article has been tweeted and retweeted occasionally starting in 2014 up to the present, um, with a real burst of activity just in the last month or so, the last few weeks of April 2015. 
Um, I looked into this a little bit and realized it coincides with the centennial of the Armenian Genocide, which many people, including Pope Francis, when speaking about it, referred to as the first genocide. There were earlier tragedies that have been overlooked and generally ignored, um, and this article brings one of those to light. Um, I found a bunch of news articles sort of responding to the Pope's planet, and unfortunately they did not cite this article, um, but it was getting attention on Twitter. Um, to a, a pretty great degree in, in recent weeks. A third example uh, comes from the Journal of Abraham Lincoln Association. And we discovered that this article on Lincoln's suspension of habeas corpus had been picked up by several news art outlets, um, sort of as an example, in articles talking about perceived attacks on the Constitution and the idea of a post-constitutional America. So this illustrates the potential of open scholarship in history to inform political discourse, and it adds a bit to what we know about this journal. It's not only for Lincoln scholars, it's not only for um, Lincoln fans and hobbyists, enthusiasts out in the public. Um, its themes are more broadly applicable, and that's, that's useful for us to know. Finally, uh, for journals that fall into any or all of these categories, uh, we hope that Altmetric will help them, help our editors to understand their own impact and communicate it back to their supporters and contributors. As I mentioned, we're currently hosting close to 40 serials. And of these, just under half are run by a single person or a group of, you know, three to five, maximum five people. Mostly they're not being compensated. They have very little support. Um, burnout and isolation are probably the greatest problems among our editors. Um, in fact, we've previously worked with another four journals that would fit into this category, run by a single or a couple of people. And in the last five years or so, they have all sort of given up. Um, or the editor is just ready to be done and, and there's no future for the journal. This sounds a bit warm and fuzzy, but I'm hopeful that access to these altmetric scores and data will help boost morale among some of these folks and help them to really recognize that they're not alone, that the work they're doing is impacting readers around the world, and it might help them to recruit new reviewers, new authors, new editorial board members, etc. I'm also hopeful that it will be um, some ammunition for them to turn back to their home institutions to make a case for why they should be granted space or server space um, or even student employees or credit for academic service um, because the work that they're doing, which probably is largely unnoticed at their own institutions, is noticed across the world. In short, we're really hopeful about the role that Altmetric might play in um, raising the profile of some of these journals and, and just providing some backup for the work of these individuals who are doing really important, really quiet work behind the scenes to share their, their scholarship. So I'm coming to the end here, but I want to return to where I began. Um, we've talked about Michigan Publishing Services, in particular our journals, um, but I also want to show you just really quickly how Altmetric is working or will work um, for the press and for Deep Blue. So the University of Michigan Press is not by definition open access. Many of our books are not, but we have a small number of open access imprints, and for those we have deployed the Altmetric badges. So this is an example from our Digital Culture Books imprint. Um, the boxes to the left show you these books showing up with scores among some of our other journal articles. To the right, you see a book that we've just published, Web Writing, and it already has a score showing up there. So far, this is only reflecting announcements about the book. It was just published a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we don't yet see any attention that reflects use or citation of this work. It's all just sort of announcements. Even this is useful, though, for our marketing um, to be able to see sort of how far the reach of this book has gone. Um, so the 27 tweets about this book um, have potentially been seen by over almost 37,000 followers on Twitter. So that's an exciting way to know how the word is getting out about our books. Deep Blue is a work in progress. Um, the screenshot here is from the Altmetric Explorer that we're able to log into as the publisher and sort of look across the board at scores of items. So these are all objects from Deep Blue. We don't yet have the donuts displaying on the screen in Deep Blue, but we're working on that. Um, so that's a next step for us. Other next steps um, are education and training for our partners, our editors, and our authors, doing that sort of outreach that Graham and Sue talked about to make sure that um, the people working with us know the value of this tool and how they can use it to their own advantage. We're doing a two-year pilot, so over this time we're going to be gathering data, um, analyzing it, reporting out, and then we'll be deciding what to do next with this tool. And that's all I have. Thank you. I'll pass over back to Phil. Thank you so much, Rebecca, and, um, and thank you to, uh, to all of the speakers. Those were some really great talks. And uh, yeah, yeah, I think that we've learned a lot about how publishers can, can use Altmetrics. 
um, for everything yeah. from uh, the sorts of things that Graham was talking about, from understanding how readers are interacting with content and interact with metrics, to how it informs editorial um, decisions and promotional work, and uh, and how it can support um, more niche uh, areas of um, of scholarship. So that was that was a really nice, uh, well-rounded exploration. So I'm just now. You have to excuse me for a second while I while I uh, fiddle about with the uh, with the interface here and figure out how to take control back from uh, from Rebecca. There we go. Oh, excuse me. You can all see my calendar now. That wasn't intended. There we go. That's what you were supposed to be able to see. All right, excellent. So we've got uh, we've got quite a few questions, um, and we've got a we've got a few minutes to ask them. Um, so first of all, um, question from Maxine Smith. Um, Sue said she got she she can get plugged into conversations that are happening, and how does she do this? Are there alerts that are sent to her, or is there a dashboard? Does she um, does this happen manually? Do you have to go into each individual article and looking at the scores? How does it how does it all work from that point of view? So that's uh, that one's for Sue. It's from Maxine Smith. Okay. Um, well, uh, I have to say it's 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 not as um, uh, as you know carefully planned out as all that. I do tend to uh, look uh, just you know go manually in and look and see what people are saying. Uh, you can switch on alerts to tell you, I believe, when somebody uh, has has made a you know a comment or, or you know that something else is, is registered. Uh, but at the moment, because we're not a huge journal, it's it's only got uh, five or six uh, scientific papers per issue. It's perfectly doable for me to just go in and poke around and follow threads. You know, just take a look at you know what people have tweeted, what they've posted on Facebook, uh, what they've said in a blog, or or go and read, uh, you know, the article with, from the LA Times about the you know uh, about the paper. So it's yeah, I'm afraid I'm just doing it the old-fashioned way, just letting curiosity and interest uh, guide where I go. Yeah. Um, yeah, we do have um, we do have a thing called the Altmetric Explorer and the API, which allows people to to interrogate the Altmetric data in all sorts of very interesting ways. Um, Graham, do you do you guys use that at Wiley? Is there anything you can tell us about how you how you use that to understand uh, the conversations that are going on on kind of a, a, a kind of more of a analytical way? Uh, yes, um, where we're in a position where we've got this running across about sixteen hundred journals um, and a number of sort of very different communities that we're working with editors in very, very different areas. Uh, we have had to really dig into the API and find ways of essentially automating some of the reporting. So primarily what we've done is we've built a number of report options that basically flag extraordinary behavior. So that can be something that's very, very bad. And lots of people talking about something for all the wrong reasons. You know, and we know and we have seen that bad science, alt metric loves bad science. It's like <laughs> if, if you want to see people really, really going for it on Twitter, bad science does that every time. Or alternatively, very, very, very exceptionally good science. Cancer research, for example, really, really excellent studies in cancer research, the public engaged with that. So you will see that very quickly. And as a result, we can then see that through, um, through the dashboard. So we have just set up um, reports that basically just flag excessive use, and that can either be a positive or a negative thing. And we have a number of ways of looking at that, but broadly that's how we've chosen to define it. And then we disseminate that information down to journal level. Mm. I could imagine as well that you get might get different types of interaction for different types of content. Something that's kind of popularly very, you know, very exciting, you know, dinosaur bones or something like that might get lots of Twitter um, or lots of uh, kind of news outlet stuff. But there might be other stuff that might get policy mentions and, and things like that. Um, that so is, you... Yes. So we also look at the different types of outlet, and we have some definitions around where we would expect um, certain types of outlet to respond in different ways. So very, very, being very general about it. Um, we don't expect to see anger banter chemi articles, for example, popping up all that often in, in you know, very, very, you know, things like the Daily Mail or 
you know, Washington Post. That's not that common. But if we don't see Mendeley um, mentions and 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 and, and sort of commenting in that way, people saying, you know, we scientific community saying we've read it, then we know that those articles haven't really hit the mark in, in, in the way that we would want them to. And so it usually indicates there's some extra work to be done from from our point of view. So so it work it works in quite a number of different ways. Yes. That's 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 really interesting how that can be how that can be analysed in a number of different ways. Rebecca, do you have anything to add to to this? Are you using this? In, are you using Altmetrics in any way like this? Sure. Um, we're using the Altmetric Explorer as sort of our our point of access into this. Um, we haven't really dug into the API yet. We're just going into the graphical interface. So. Um, as has kind of been shown with these different screenshots, the, the badges or the donuts are visible on an article at anyone looking at the article. But the Explorer is software that's available to the, the publisher um, that you can log into, and it shows you everything sort of all at once. Um, what we've done there is, or at least what I've done for tracking on the journals in particular, is I created a sort of saved workspace um, that filters for all of the ISSNs of our journals that are tracked there. And so every time I log in, I can just return to that workspace um, what I'm doing now is just sort of popping in, keeping tabs on it periodically. What we found is um, when we first found all of our stuff in Altmetric being tracked and saw all the scores, it became immediately obvious what our sort of highest scores were, um, the most popular articles, where they were. And now that we have gotten familiar with that sort of baseline, um, the, it stays pretty stable. There's not a ton of change. So I'm sort of checking in to see, oh, has a, ch has a score changed drastically or has something that previously had no score has it suddenly risen to the surface um, I'm doing it just manually um, but through a saved sort of filtered view in the Explorer that's great that's great um, yeah thanks very much those are those are some great answers um, so the next question now um, one from from Beth you'll have to excuse the pronunciation uh, Beth Staley or Starley um, so it's, this one's for this one's for Sue again. Um, when you started a Twitter account for your journal, did you recruit tweeters or did you just wait to to see what happened? So so I, I guess the the question is really um, how did you kind of get the uh, get the social media conversation going? Did you do anything to kickstart it? Uh, yeah, well, yes. Again, you have to put this in context. Um, you know, I'm one journal in a relatively small organization. There wasn't, um, you know any any great um, budget for any anything that we did um, basically I hired an intern uh, because it's very clear to me that anybody you know under the age of 25 knows how to do this with both hands tied behind their back and quite frankly I had no clue uh, so as I say we we got a bright uh, young uh, fresh out of college intern who set up our Twitter account um, and started tweeting. Uh, she knew, as as nobody in ESA would, that uh, if you start following people, they'll start following you back, and that gets you your first followers, and then you carry on from there. And uh, she and I sort of set a tone for our tweets, where you know, not not too frivolous, but also not too heavy and boring. You know, something that we felt was uh, appropriate for our audience, but would still, you know attention and and get people looking and uh, so that's how we started and I can say that the 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 followers have gone up regularly every day by three or four people so that now we're at 1830 or so and it's just it's almost you know a straight line upwards we just keep picking up people at the same pace uh, it go it surges when we have a really sexy paper that you know lots and lots of people comment on and send to each other then we get a little bump in the graph but otherwise it just slowly goes up but that's how we started in turn excellent a wonderful, yes, a wonderful invention <laughs> i think that's i think that's great advice i would say one way to kind of get twi twitter followers is to conference tweet I found that's always the most effective way of doing it. If you're at a conference and you, uh, you know, p particularly uh, if you're looking for academics to follow you, you know, put somebody in a scientific conference and have them tweet about you know, some of the exciting and interesting things that are going on. That'll that'll get you some followers. It has, in my experience, anyway. Um, so um, the next question is is a logistical question. Um, when the donuts are placed in an article, are they clickable? 
Right now we're using Opmetric to look at how articles are doing behind the scenes, so I'm not sure how journal users could interact um, with the metric. Um, Graham, would you like to would you like to give that a quick answer? Yeah, so the way in which we embed that in Wiley Online Library, we have an individual clickable link at the article level. So at, the, at, at that point, if someone comes into the article in Online Library, they see a link that shows there is a link through to article level metrics. And at that point, clicking through opens up a small dialog box that shows you an immediate view of the number of mentions, likes, and, and so on, all, all sitting there in one quick view. If you then proceed through, then you see much, much more detail at the article level. But we, we have that enabled at the individual article level. Excellent. That's a, that's a great answer. Um, so in the interest of time, um, there are lots of great questions that have, that have, that have come in, um, but I'm, I'm going to kind of call time here and just have, ask one more question, um, because I think this is a particularly good one. This is from Richard Hund, um, and the question is, what do publishers do with this information in the end? You may see that a given article is getting traction, but what precisely do you do next with this information? Um, specific examples would be helpful. So, you know, how might it inform editorial policy or how might it inform um, marketing or, or public relations exercises or, or something like that? What, where, do you, where do you kind of make actionable, um, actionable uh, objectives out of this? And I guess we'll just kind of, um, we'll start with Rebecca because we haven't, we haven't heard from Rebecca in a little while. Would you like to talk about how you do that at, uh, at Michigan? Sure. So again, this is very new for us and I think this is what we're going to be figuring out over the next couple of years is, is what will we do with this data. Um, I think sort of on the one-off level, the very first thing we would do is simply bring it to the attention of the editor. Um, and again, we're working with these sort of small publications, um, each with, you know, very sort of small leadership with whom we have really individual relationships. So I, I would just write to the editor and say, did you know, you know, this came to our attention, you should look at it too, might be of interest to your editorial board, might be of interest to your peer reviewers and just try to get them to generate a little enthusiasm and excitement about it. Um, that would be sort of a, at the micro level. As for the macro level, kind of analyzing big, big picture here, I, I think this will really um, mostly inform advocacy for our operation and, and for our journals. You know, we might be able to include this data in an annual report of our own or, you know, when trying to reflect the value of open access publishing, that sort of thing. Um, we, at least for our journals, we don't make the editorial decisions. That's really in the hands of the editors. So for us, it would not be informing, oh, we want to recruit more of this kind of paper or that kind of paper, although we certainly might be able to encourage editors to think about those things. I think for us, it would really be about um, trying to demonstrate to funders, to institutional backers, to other kinds of stakeholders, the value of what we're doing here in the library and what our individual journals are doing. Right, so there's a, there's a sense that further down the line you might use this for advocacy. Yeah. Yeah. All right, um, Sue, would you like to feel this one? So what do you do with the information when you've got a, when you've got a nice piece of information about, in, about uh, alternative impact? What do you do with it? Uh, well, the first thing uh, that, I, that I should say is that after a year, uh, of of running uh, altmetrics for frontiers all of the other journals got it in the at the beginning of this year so you know i reported to the executive director and told her and showed her you know what had been going on and the attention it was getting and what people were saying uh, and they were switched on for for all the other journals um, we also need to give it a bit more time it's early days yet for us too um, but I have to report to a governing board, you know, to my executive director, uh, to um, a, also my editorial board and tell them about it. Uh, we also use it for things like when we are running a new series, we're interested to see if, if people are uh, excited about it and interested in it. If uh, I'm happy to say that with our latest series they are and so we know that we're on the right track and we can carry on running that series um, so again it's it's not terribly uh, scientific or planned at the moment we're just sort of flying on you know on gut feeling really as to what well, we do of your pants. <laughs> yes exactly right 
Uh, excellent, excellent. So, um, so Graham, um, so how about at scale then? Could you do you have the last word on on this question? Yeah, so there's the sort of two two things that spring to mind immediately. One is the the PR angle, publicity side of things that that this enables us to do, and that's really very much at the granular level. That's individual articles. We're able to see very quickly articles that we may not have picked in advance to say these are the ones that are really going to fly. There's there's something you can you can see very quickly if they're getting real traction, and you can really really run on the back of that and and push that much further and really drive discovery of the article itself and then usage down at the article level um, very easily. And then on the, on the larger scale, we're, we're really looking at over time measuring the impact of the research portfolio and using article level metrics in one way or another as a very, very meaningful measure that stacks up alongside impact factor and that turns up a bit quicker than impact factor. And we're not at any moment saying impact factor goes away because it really doesn't and it clearly is incredibly important. But there's something additional in the article level metrics that we do see and that, that are very useful and very relevant and that do give a measure of impact very, very quickly. Excellent. That's, that's great. So, um, so thanks very much um, to all the speakers. Again, um, this brings us to the end of our webinar. And, and also, thanks a lot to, to all of the attendees, to everybody who, who came and, and listened to all the talks. I think this was a, this was a great this was a great session, a great webinar, and, and I certainly have learned an awful lot about how publishers are using our metrics, um, both in terms of understanding the conversations that are going on and also in terms of serving authors and, um, and informing things like editorial decisions and, and business decisions um, of publishers, both at the, uh, the large commercial publisher level and at the smaller um, society publisher and, uh, and even for, for the librarian publishers as well. So thanks very much to everybody. This was really great, and, um, and I look forward to, uh, to doing this again sometimes. Thanks very much, everybody. Bye.